extreme earnings volatility from Facebook and Amazon. ECB shocks rates markets with a hawkish pivot and cracks start to appear in European sovereign credit. Oil looks way overbought and ripe for a pullback as Iran nuclear talks resume. All this and more in this week's Macro Insight. Welcome back to Macro Insight, everyone. Today is the 8th of February. Uh, welcome to any new subscribers. Good to have you here. And let's see what's going on in these markets. So um, last week, uh, we saw pockets of extreme volatility. Um, you had, <clears throat> what did you have? Starting with the micro, both macro and micro, right? We had um, on the micro side, massive post earnings volatility in mega cap stocks like Google, which was up 10% at one point, Meta or Facebook, obviously down about 25. Uh, and Amazon then was up 10 to 13, I believe it finished. You also had Snapchat was like up 60 at one point. Uh, Peloton pre-market was up 45 to then get faded. I mean, these are insanely big moves on earnings, like more than we've seen in a while. And, and it's not happening with small companies, right? Um, now, the meta move was the largest market cap loss in history of any company in a day, and that was followed by the largest increase in market cap ever in a day from Amazon, right? So these are, these are the type of insane moves that happen. I do think some of this is being exaggerated by options market flows that are just pushing stocks around and just general liquidity in the entire market in terms of depth on the bid and offer just going down as some some metrics that Goldman's have been putting out recently have been talking about I think that is a bit of a function of it but when things are winging around like they are it just goes to show that no one's got a clue what anything's worth right and that is from my perspective when I start to see that amount of volatility going on under the hood even though the broad indices aren't doing much it makes me a little bit nervous that things are not so great under the hood when things are winging around so violently OK, um, now, funnily enough, these double digit moves in stocks did not steal the limelight from uh, for those who are volatility adjusting and looking at the macro space. Right. So if you saw in the macro space, what did we see? Well, we had um, six sigma moves right in uh, in the likes of European rates. So that was the big story last week. Obviously, this is a chart I like to show. Obviously, you can see on the downside, Facebook was down four sigma, but it was beaten by a six sigma up move in European rates after we had the ECB guidance from the press, press conference that actually they may well be hiking this year, which the market wasn't really ready for. And the market reaction you know, was certainly one of surprise um, from this kind of capitulation by Lagarde that the ECB are pretty much saying, yeah, inflation's out of control. Uh, we need to do something about it, okay? And that's quite, that's in contrary to what she had said in December, right? So a little bit of throwing in the towel there, basically. Uh, UK rates uh, were also pretty hawkish. Um, so yeah, the Bank of England, they hiked rates, but the hawkish bit was, the more hawkish bit was the fact that four of the of the committee were looking, wanting to hike by 50, okay? Which was a bit of a surprise to the market again. Uh, but then in the press conference, they kind of talked it down a bit in terms of they had concerns about growth going forward due to you know the high energy prices in the UK and things like that. You look at their projections for inflation and growth. We're seeing higher infl inflation numbers than they were previously forecasting, but growth kind of trending back down, suggesting that there's there is a chance of a bit of a stagflationary outlook for the UK, which keeps them a bit more cautious. On that stagflationary note, you know, the twos tens in the UK has been flattening pretty hard, right? So it's only down to about 20 basis points now. Um, often, you know, a sign that the market's basically saying, yeah, you're going to stifle growth. And if we do get that dreaded inversion, which is only 20 basis points away, a lot of rates, people think that's a, a leading indicator to recession, right? So something to be aware of that the UK market is kind of pricing that in arguably sooner than say the US, okay? 
If we look at what's being priced in uh, for the March meetings in terms of rates, you've basically got uh, the UK for March pricing in 37 and a half bips. So basically a hike, you know, a hike and a half is priced in for, for the Bank of England. Uh, for the Fed, it's uh, similar. It's like about one and a half hikes, so 34 basis points priced in for uh, Fed. And then if you look at European short-term rates, they're pricing in about 50 basis points worth of hikes this year, right? Which, you know, in December, Lagarde was saying nothing's happening this year. Okay. Um, over the weekend, the hawks have been getting louder. Um, the governor, not, uh, Klaus Knott from the ECB, saying he expects a hike by October. Um, now, even though he said that, euro dollar didn't really move much after the weekend. If anything, it's kind of drifted a bit back from the highs um, after that vicious repricing last week. So that's not margin. He's, he is known to be a hawk. So that's not really marginally hawkish, him coming out and saying that, basically. OK, um, in terms of what else uh, is going on, the, the thing that's got me a bit worried, you know, I've been trying to be optimistic about this market, right, and thinking that a lot is getting priced in, we're due a bit of a bounce, but I can't help but notice some, some worrying signs in the credit market, basically, right? So, you know, we've got, obviously, we've got the two-year German yield, massive spike there, um, five years gone positive, obviously, Bund's gone Bund's gone positive. Uh, but the thing that worries me is this kind of spread between BTP and Bunds, right? So this is the Italian sovereign spread versus Germany. And that is starting to create, that's crept above 150 basis points, heading towards 200 basis points, right? So Lagarde had kind of said, oh, spreads aren't widening, blah, 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 we could stop QE. And the minute she said that, the, the, the credit markets turn around and say, oh, you don't want to do that, right? And, she's, and it started... Um, basically increasing that credit risk between Italy and Germany, okay? You look at the bottom left chart, we've got Italy, Spain, Portugal, the usual suspects in terms of the European sovereign crisis names that, that, that caused problems back in 2011, 12. All of those, all of those rates have started gapping higher, basically, since, since what the ECB said on Thursday. So that is a space we've got to keep a very close eye on because that can become the epicenter of stress in Europe. And that can signal a lot of problems in Europe. And for now, that's been kept in check for a long time because the ECB has been there as a backstop for those bond markets, right? If they pull, pull away the, and the, we go back to a free market in that space, we, we may start to see some quick problems, okay? And then I've got on the, on the bottom right, I've got the high yield OAS, option adjusted spreads. Um, this is from 42 Macro, one of the things they keep track of in terms of their macro assets. And again, that's quietly creeping up to like year highs where, you know, high yield credit basically starting to get wider and wider, okay? Um, which, you know, you would normally expect to see when you're going into tighter financial conditions, but generally when you start to see those cracks in the credit market, usually equity suffers alongside that, okay? Um, and then on that note, this is quite a nice chart showing the kind of correlation between, you know, these, these credit indices relative to the volatility indices in equities, right? So on the left, we've got the ITRAX main, which is a European credit index versus high yield versus, uh, actually ITRAX main is, uh, I think might be the corporate one, and that's versus the V-stocks. Uh, and you can see, you know, often spikes in that orange line, not every single time, but often they kind of lead that, that V stocks, which is the VIX equivalent for Europe, that European volatility index lead it higher, right? There have been times, like I said, back here in um, sort of Q1, 21, there was a spike and then vol didn't move and then it just reverted back down. So it doesn't have to close in that way with um, vol spiking, but it has done it quite a lot and it's just something to be aware of basically, right? Those, there's something out of whack there basically. Similar in the US VIX versus the CDX basically, right? So these credit indices, definitely something to keep on the radar if these things continue to deteriorate, right? They, they, it's gonna be hard. I mean, VIX has pulled back quite a lot from those highs. It's gonna struggle to pull back much more unless this credit stuff calms down, I suspect, okay? So, you know, the S&P, you know, it's been a bit choppy. You can see that from the kind of size of these candles and the wicks. It's kind of stayed, stayed in this downtrend for now uh, from, the, from that sell-off from early Jan. Uh, so it hasn't managed to really break above that. 
Although, you know, my sort of wave count that I was looking for was potentially negated because of this very slight overlap that we had in that rally last week that kind of crossed with this 10th of January low. Okay. So that, that kind of suggests that we may have a bottom in here and we may not need to retest that bottom. And this bounce might be a wave one. This correction is a two and we're going to stay some sort of three at some point and move higher. Right. So I would be looking for dips to buy into around these key supports uh, that I've mentioned at 44 and a quarter, 43, 30 odd. And even down here, depending on what the momentum signals are doing on the way down there. Obviously, if we get too aggressive and roll over, then you might need to chill out. But, you know, in dips down to these key supports, I will be probably looking to add risk and do it via option structures, right? Given the deteriorating macro big picture backdrop, you don't want to buy too much outright delta, I don't think, in these dips, because it you could be wrong and it just could be the beginning of a much bigger down move, which we kind of see coming. But I think using option structures, like the sort of things I've been doing recently, uh, as subscribers will know, that's the way to stay safe and, and buy dips safely, right? The kind of maturities I'd be looking in are like March and April, basically, to play some sort of bounce. We've been getting cyclical leadership as we as we kind of thought we would get. You've had uh, metals and mining up six odd percent, energy up another five, XLF financials up three. Uh, obviously, subscribers have kind of seen that I bought some KRE, which is a regional banking. ETF uh, March calls a couple of weeks back. Those have done okay so far. Uh, so that price action in that in that ETF has been pretty strong in the face of higher yields, as, as was the expectation. Uh, and, and I'm kind of planning to hold those calls till the end of February to see if I can, you know, uh, monetize those sort of by then. I, 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 may, I may take a little bit of profit on those just to bank some money, um, but for now I haven't touched them. In terms of gamma positioning, you know, the S&P gamma positioning does appear to be more balanced. Like I said, NASDAQ's a bit short, but S&P, you know, has a kind of zero gamma to vol trigger area around the 45.20, so about a percent above where we are now. Um, so as we go down, we do slip into shorter and shorter gamma territory. Um, so things probably going to remain fairly choppy. Um, but, you know, if the market can manage to pop its head above 4,600, that's when you'd expect things to get more sticky, volatility to come down in terms of realized and implied. And if that happens towards expiry next Friday, then yeah, you could you could get a bit of pinning happening over there. But for now, that, that's, that's still a way off. We'd still need to rally a good sort of 3% really for that to come into play. Um, if you look at the VIX, it's at 23, uh, probably a little bit higher now. Uh, you know, still got room to go both ways, right? So no real conviction. Uh, at these levels on the VIX, I wouldn't say. Skew, on the other hand, has cheapened up. Um, so if you see this chart over here on the right, you've got the S&P in purple, you've got the uh, skew index in orange. Compare that to where we were um, at the start of the year, that skew's come down considerably from like 156 down to 130, right? So that suggests that there has been some monetization of the downside that's happened. Um, and protection start starting to nibble again on protection could make sense, right? If you are a bit worried about that macro backdrop and what you're seeing happening in the credit market. So DXY, you know, sharply back towards the recent lows, but it was all about euro, really. Okay, so um, you know, as the euro adjusted to the more hawkish ECB than expectations, that sent DXY plummeting, and it sent you know, euro straight back to this kind of 114 and a half, 11480 area. So that was really what dr drove pretty much all of the DXY move. It's a pretty strong resistance by the looks of it. It's failed at the first test, but you know, it remains to be seen what's going to come out of the ECB and how 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 that what goes on. I do think peripheral spreads widening out the way they are is going to keep a lid on the euro, right? So I think that is one thing that's going to kind of make it hard for the euro to break much higher than here, given that they've Kind of now signaled that they're not going to be as supportive doing QE in the bond market, then you know I, I think that's going to make it hard for Euro to rally that much, right? But but keep an eye if that if that resistance breaks, you know, then you've definitely got room to another another couple of big figures higher in Euro, basically. Okay, which is about two percent down in DXY from here. So on the commodities front, if we take a look at oil first, um, so after breaking above ninety in WTI, oil's taking a bit of a breather. 
Okay, that's been helped by the fact that, you know, these time spreads that I've been talking about, front month future spreads that were in backwardation, still are in backwardation, got as high as $2. They've pulled back to about one and a half in, um, in crude, uh, suggesting that that kind of crunch on inventories at Cushing has calmed down a bit. Still must be something there given the backwardation, but not as acute as it was. That's going to help take a, the sting out of that oil move a little bit. Um, obviously, it looks super overbought in the short term. This thing just went up in a straight line, has not really had any meaningful pullbacks. I've taken some profit on oil um, because, yeah, it's just looking very stretched right now. Um, and then also there's some speculation that the Iran uh, nuclear talks with them resuming, if some sort of deal was to get reached, uh, that might be a way for Biden to basically get, get gasoline prices down a bit, right? Because if Iran ramp up their production, they've got production capacity, they could bring, you know, however many, many million barrels to the table, because the OPEC members right now are struggling to meet their quotas. That's why the market's so tight. So to relieve some of that tightness in the market, we may have Iranian oil coming online if some sort of nuclear deal can get reached. So that's the speculation that might drive a pullback in oil in the short term. Me personally, I've lightened up, like I said, on my longs. I still think this thing goes a lot higher. The trend is strong. Any blip on Iran will probably be short lived. I would look at, you know, if I show you what my levels are in oil. Yeah, so we started to see a pullback today, even. Um, I think 86 and a half was the first sort of uh, confluence retracement level, and then 82 and a bit. So those are the two bits where I'd start to add back if, if we got there. So still a ways to go. Uh, but, you know, given how volatile this thing has been or how big the up move has been, you know, there's plenty of room for it to pull back. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like this content, please subscribe to our channel, give the video a thumbs up, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. To watch the entire macro call, which includes the live Q&A and a walkthrough of all my top trades, you can sign up for a free trial to Macro Insight. If you join our exclusive trading community, you'll get access to our Telegram group, and you'll also get weekly market reports summarizing the macro call. The link is in the description to the video. And for more information, you can connect with us on socials, or you can visit our website, options-insight.com. Thanks a lot.